In the Story of Civilizations, Part 2, The Life of Greece in the History of Greek Civilization from the Beginnings and of Civilization in the Near East, from the Death of Alexander to the Roman Conquest, with an Introduction on the Prehistoric Culture of Crete by Will Durant, Chapter 17, The Literature of the Golden Age, Section 3, Ascalus. Not quite at the outset, for as many talents in heredity and history prepare the way for a genius. So, some lesser playwrights who may here be forgotten with honor intervened between Thespis and Ascalus. Perhaps it was the successful resistance to Persia that gave Athens the pride and stimulus necessary to an age of great drama, while the wealth that came with trade and empire after the war provided for the costly Dionysian contests in the Arambic singing and the choral play. Ascalus felt both the stimulus and the pride in person. Like so many Greek writers of the 5th century BCE, he lived as well as wrote, and knew how to do as well as to speak. In 499, BCE, at the age of 26, he produced his first play. In 490, he and his two brothers fought at Marathon. And so bravely that Athens ordered the painting to commemorate their deeds. In 484 BCE, he won his first prize at the Dionysian festival. In 480, he fought at Artemisium and Salamis. And in 479, at Plataea. In 476 and 470, he visited Syracuse and was honored at the court of Hieron I. In 468 BCE, after dominating Athenian literature for a generation, he lost the first prize for drama to the youthful Sophocles. In 467, he recaptured supremacy with his seven against Thebes. In 458, he won his last and greatest victory with the Aristia trilogy. In 456, he was again in Sicula, and there in that year he died. It took a man of such energy to mold the Greek drama into its classic form. It was Ascalus who added a second actor to the one drawn out from the chorus at Thespis, and thereby completed the transformation of the Dionysian chant from an oratorio into a play. Though in Ascalus the actors were only two, the roles they played in the drama were limited only in the sense that no more than two characters could be on the stage at once. The leader of the chorus was sometimes individualized into a third actor. Minor characters, attendants, soldiers, etc. were not counted as actors. He wrote 70, some say 90 dramas, of which seven remain. Of these, the earliest three are minor works. The, suppli uh, the suppliant woman is of the primitive type in which the chorus predominates. The Persians is also mostly choral and vividly describes the Battle of Salamis. The Seven Against Steps was the third play in a trilogy that told the story of King Laias and his queen Dacasta, the patricide and incest of their son Oedipus, and the conflict between the sons of Oedipus for the Theban throne. The most famous is the Prometheus bound, the greatest makeup of the Oresteia trilogy. The Prometheus bound too may have been part of a trilogy, though no ancient authority vouches for this. We hear of a satire play by Ascalus called Prometheus the Firebringer, but it was produced apart from the Prometheus Bound, 
and a quite different combination. Fragments survive of a Prometheus Unbound by Ascalus. These are well nigh meaningless, but anxious, but anxious scholars assure us that if we had the full text, we should find Ascalus answering satisfactorily all the heresies which the extant play puts into the hero's lines. Even so, it is noteworthy that an Athenian audience at a religious festival should have put up with the Tetan's blasphemies. As the play opens, we find Prometheus being chained to a rock in the Caucasus by Hephaestus at the command of Zeus, irate because Prometheus has taught men the art of fire. Hephaestus speaks. High thoughted son of the niece, who is sage, thee loath I loathe, must revet fast in chains, against this rocky height, uncloned by man, where never human voice nor face shall find, out thee who lovest them, and thy beauty's flower, scorched in the sun's clear heat, shall fade away, night shall come up with garniture of stars, to comfort thee with shadow, and the sun, disperse with retricked beams, the morning frosts. But through all dangers the sense of present woe shall vex thee sore, because with none of them there comes a hand to free. Such fruit is plucked from love of man, for Zeus is stern, and new-made kings are cruel. Some of the lovers' cards have a couple. I have a young man and a young woman chained up, a monster in between. And, of course, the guy is trying to break free, or maybe the guy is trying to cut free the maiden in chains. Such fruit is plucked. Hanging helpless on the crag, Prometheus hurls defiance to Olympus and recounts proudly the steps by which he brought civilization to primitive men who till then lived like silly ants beneath the ground in hollow caves unsunned. There came to them no steadfast sign of winter nor of spring. Flower perfumed, nor of summer full of fruit. But blindly and lawlessly they did all things, until I taught them how the stars do rise and set in mystery, and devised for them, number, the inducer of philosophies, the synthesis of letters and besides, the artificer of all things memory, that sweet muse mother, I was first to yoke the servile beasts, and none but I originated ships, and I who did devise for mortals all these arts have no device left now to save myself. The whole earth mourns with him. There is a cry in the waves of the sea, as they fall together, and a groaning in the deep, a wail that comes up from the cavern realms of death. All the nations set, send their condolences to this political prisoner, and bid him remember that suffering visits all. Grief walks the earth and sits down at the feet of each by turns, but they do nothing to free him. Achianus advises him to yield seeing that who reigns, reigns by cruelty instead of right, and the chorus of Achaeans, daughters of the sea, wonder whether humanity deserves to be suffered for with such a crucifixion. Nay, thine was a, hap was a helpless sacrifice, O beloved. Didst thou not see the race of men, how little an effort and energy, dreamers bound in chains, Nevertheless, they so admire him that when Zeus threatens to hurl him down into Tartarus, they stay by him and face with him 
the thunderbolt that blasts them, and Prometheus into the abyss. But Prometheus, being a god, is denied the easement of death. In the lost conclusion of the trilogy, he is raised up from Tartarus to be again chained to a mountain rock, uh, to a mountain rock, and a vulture is commissioned by Zeus to gnaw out the titan's heart. The heart grows by night as fast as the vulture consumes it by day. Some of those tarot cards for the lovers, you actually see a bird. In this way, Prometheus suffers through 13 generations of men. Kind of like the Kabbalah, you got the 10, the 3, right? Then, the kindly giant Heracles kills the vulture and persuades Zeus to free Prometheus. The Titan repents, makes his peace with omnipotence, and places upon his finger the iron ring of necessity. What do we have? The ring of the Nibelobum or something like that? In Greek, uh, not Greek, uh, German mythology. It has a curse, but only in terms of those who think of it as good and evil. In this simple and profound trilogy, Aeschylus set the theme of Greek drama. The struggle of human will against the inescapable destiny and the theme of the life of Greece in the 5th century BCE, the conflict between rebellious thought and traditional belief. His conclusion is conservative, but he knows the case for the rebel and gives it all his sympathy, not even in Euripides shall we find so critical a view of Olympus. This is another paradise lost in which the fallen angel, despite the poet's piety, is the hero of the tale. Perhaps Milton often recalled Aeschylus' Titan when he composed such eloquent speeches for Satan. Goth was fond of this play and used Prometheus as a mouthpiece in irreverent youth. Byron made him the model of nearly all his selves, and Shelley, always at odds with fate, brought the story back to life in Prometheus Unbound, where the rebel never yields. The legend hides a dozen allegories. Suffering is the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Well, the Heraclean myths are centered around more than a dozen allegories. The zodiacal nature, right? So, knowledge. Again, uh, we, so we have another tarot card here. We have the hanged man. To know the future is to gnaw one's heart away. Um, there's a bird on the wheel card, too. The, liberator, the liberator is always crucified, and in the end, one must escape limits. Man must and Sagan must accomplish his purpose within the nature of things. This is a noble theme and helps the majestic language of Aeschylus to make the Prometheus a tragedy in the grand style. Never has the war between knowledge and superstition, enlightenment and obscurantism, genius and dogma, been more powerfully pictured, are lifted to a higher reach of symbol and utterance. The other productions of the Greek tragedians, said Schlegel, are so many tragedies, but this is tragedy herself. Nevertheless, the Aristia is greater still, by common consent, the finest achievement in Greek drama, perhaps in all drama. It was produced in 458, probably two years after Prometheus bound, and two years before the author's death. The theme is the fateful breeding of violence by violence, and the inescapable punishment through generation after generation of insolent pride and excess. We call it a legend, but the Greeks perhaps rightly called it history. The story, as told by each of the greater dramatists of Greece, might be called the children of Tantalus, for it was he, the Phrygian king, so recklessly proud in his wealth, who began the long chain of crime, and called down the vengeance of the Furies by stealing the nectar and ambrosia of what were considered to be gods. Um, some more detailed theme in India and giving the divine food to Pelops, his son, in every age some men acquire more wealth than befits a man, and use it to spoil their children. We have seen how Pelops by foul means won the throne of Elis. 
slew his accomplice and married the daughter of the king whom he had deceived and killed. By Hippodamia, he had three children, the Estes, Arope, Atreus, the Estes, seduce Arope, Atreus, to avenge his sister, served up his brother's children to him at a banquet, whereupon Agisthus, son of the Estes, by the Estes's daughter, vowed vengeance upon Atreus and his line. Atreus had two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. Agamemnon married Clytamnestra and had by her two daughters, Iphigenia and Electra, and one son, Orestes. At Aulis, where his ships were becalmed on the way to True, Agamemnon, to the horror of Clytamnestra, sacrificed Iphigenia to induce the winds to blow. While Agamemnon besieged True, Agisthus courted his brooding wife, won her, and plotted with her to kill the king. It is at this point that Ascalus takes up the tale. The news has come to Argos that the war is over. And proud Agamemnon, robed in steel, and armies trembled at his wrath, has landed on the Peloponnesian shores, and is approaching Makena. A chorus of elders appears before the royal palace, and an ominous chant recalls Agamemnon's abandonment of Iphigenia. In that which must be, he armed him slowly, and a strange wind within his bosom tossed, a wind of dark thought, unclean, unholy, and he rose up, daring to the uttermost, for men are boldened by a blindness straying toward base desire, which brings grief hereafter, yea, and itself is grief. So this man, hardened to his own child slaying, has helped to avenge him for a woman's laughter, and bring his ship's relief, with violence and a curb's voiceless, voiceless wrath, her stole of saffron to the ground she threw, and her eye with an arrow of Pity found its path. To each man's heart that slew, a face in a pitcher, striving amazedly, the little maid who danced at her father's board. The innocent voice, man's love, came never nigh, who joined to his her little patent cry when the third cup was poured. Agamemnon's herald enters to announce the coming of the king. Ascalus realizes with fine imagination the joy of the simple soldier as he sets foot, after a long absence, upon his native soil. Now, says the herald, I am ready, if God will, to die. He describes to the chorus the terror and filth of the war, the rain that sent a moisture into the bones, the vermin that multiplied in the hair, the breathless heat of Elion's summer, and the winter so cold that all the birds fell dead. Cla Tamnestra comes from the palace, somber, nervous, and yet proud, and orders rich hangings to be strewn for Agamemnon's path. The king enters in the royal chariot, escorted by his troops, and erect in the pride of victory. Behind him is another chariot, bearing the darkly beautiful Cassandra, Trojan princess and prophetess, you know, the I, the term has come to mean somebody who speaks on a religious authority about everything. I mean, as in, like, prophetic authority for everything. Not just referencing something and trying to make conclusions based on what you think is right via what came through the prophets. The resentful slave of Agamemnon's lust who bitterly predicts his punishment, and gloomily foresees her own death. With clever speech, Thotamnestra recounts to the king her years of longing for this return. For you indeed the rushing fountains of my tears have run dry, and there is no drop left, but in my eyes worn with late watching, you may see how I sorrowed for the signals of your victory that ever tarried, and in my disturbed sleep, I started at 
the faint buzzing of the gnat's wing, for I dreamt of you, long tales of woe, crowded into a short moment of repose. He suspects her sincerity and reproves her dourly for the lavish outlay of broidered hangings under his horse's feet. But he follows her into the palace, and Cassandra resignedly accompanies him, though an intense pause in the action, the chorus intones softly a song of evil premonition, and then from within comes the cry towards which every line of the drama has moved, the death cry of Agamemnon, slain by Agisthus and Clatamnestra. The portals open, Clatamnestra is shown with an axe in hand and blood on her brow, standing triumphant over the corpses of Cassandra and the king, and the chorus chants at the end. Would God that suddenly, with no great agony, no long sick watch to keep, my hour would come to me, my hour and presently, bring the eternal, the unwaking sleep, now that my shepherd, he whose love watched over me, lies in the deep. The second play in the trilogy, the Co Eforo, are Libation Bearers, takes its title from the chorus of women who bring offerings to the grave of the king. Clatamnestra has sent her young son, Orestes, to be reared in distant Hawkis, hoping that he may forget his father's death. But old men there teach him the ancient law of vengeance. The shed drop doth crave new blood. The state in those days left the punishment of the murderer to the dead man's kin, and men believed that the soul of the slain would know no peace till he had been avenged. Orestes, haunted and horrified at the thought of his mission to kill his mother, and Agisthus comes secretly to Argos with his comrade Pilatus, seeks out his father's tomb, and lays upon it a lock of his hair. Hearing the approach of the libation bearers, the young men withdraw, and listen in fascination as Electra, Orestes's brooding sister, comes with the women, stands over the grave, and calls upon Agamemnon's spirit to arouse Orestes to avenge him. Orestes reveals himself, and from her bitter heart she pours into his simple mind the thoughts that he must kill their mother. The youths, disguised as merchants, proceed to the royal palace. Clatamnestra softens them with hospitality, but when Orestes tests her by saying that the boy she sent to Phocis is dead, he is shocked to see a secret joy hiding in her grief. She calls Agisthus to share with him the news that the avenger whom they feared is no more. Orestes slays him, drives his mother into the palace, and comes out a moment later already half insane. with the consciousness that he is a matricide. While I am still not mad, I here declare to all who love me and confess that I have slain my mother. Well, if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Um, but honestly, um, it, it shouldn't straight up be required of the family to kill family. In the third play, Orestes is pursued. In the poet's externalization of the boy's wild fancy, well, sometimes we come to conclusions that aren't actually what should be the case, right? By the Erinnas, are furies, whose task it is to punish crime, and from their euphemistic depreciatory title, the Humanides are well-wishers. The play derives its name. Orestes is an outcast shunned by all men. Wherever he goes, the Furies hang over him, as a black ghost crying out for his blood. He flings himself upon the altar of Apollo at Delphi, and Apollo comforts him. But the shade of Clatamnestra rises from the earth to urge the Furies not to desist from torturing her son. Orestes goes to Athens, kneels before Athena's shrine, and cries out to her for deliverance. Athena hears him and calls him perfect by suffering. When the Erinaeus protest, 
she summons them to try Orestes's case before the Council of the Areopagus. The concluding scene shows this strange trial, symbolical of the replacement of blood revenge with law. Athena, goddess of the city, presides. The theories state the case for vengeance against Orestes, and Apollo defends him. The court divides evenly. Athena casts the deciding ballot in favor of Orestes and declares him free. She solemnly establishes the council of the Areopagus as henceforth the supreme court of Attica, whose swift condemnation of the murderer shall free the land from feuds, and whose wisdom will guide the state through the dangers that beset every people. The goddess, by her fair speech, appeases the disappointed furies, and so wins them that their leader says, This day a new order is born. After the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Orestia is the highest achievement in Greek literature. Here is a breath of conception, a unity of thought and execution, a power of dramatic development, an understanding of character, and a splendor of style which, in their sum, we shall not find again before Shakespeare. The trilogy is as closely knit as the three acts of a well-designed drama. Each part foreshadows and requires the next with logical inevitability. As play succeeds play, the terror of the theme grows until we begin dimly to realize how deeply this story must have moved the Greeks. It is true that there is too much talk, even for four murderers, that the lyrics are often obscure, their metaphors exaggerated, their language sometimes heavy and rough and strained, Nevertheless, these chorals are supreme in their kind, full of grandeur and tenderness, eloquent with their plea for a new religion of forgiveness, and for the virtues of a political order that was passing away. For the Arastaya, as a conservative, as the Prometheus is radical, though only two years seem to have separated them in time, in 462, at the Altus, deprived the Areopagus of its powers. In 461, he was assassinated. In 458, Ascalus offered in the Orestia a defense of the council of the Areopagus as the wisest body in the Athenian government. The poet was now full of years and could understand the old more than more easily than the young. Like Aristophanes, he longed for the virtues of the men of Marathon. Athanas would have us believe that Ascalus was a great drinker, but in the Orestia, he is a Puritan preaching a sermon in buskins on sin and its punishment and the wisdom born of suffering. The law of Habris and Nemesis is another doctrine of karma, or of original sin. Every evil deed will be found out and be avenged in one life or another. In this way, Greek thought made its trial at reconciling evil with God all suffering is due to sin, even if it is the sin of a generation that is dead. Well, certain effects can linger on materially, right? Um, particularly the social situation. The author of Ponotheus was no naive pietist. His plays, even in the Arestia, are studded with heresies. He was attacked for revealing ritual secrets and was saved only by the intercession of his brother, Aminius, who bared before the assembly the wounds he had received at Salamis, but Ascalus was convinced that morality, told its own against unsocial impulse, required supernatural sanctions. He hoped that one there is who heareth on high some Pan or Zeus, some seer Apollo, and sendeth down for the law transgressed the wrath of the feet that follow, i.e. the furies of consciousness and retribution. Therefore he speaks with a solemn reverence for religion and makes an effort to reach beyond polytheism to the conception of one God. Zeus, Zeus, whatever he be, if this name he loved to hear, this he shall be called of me. Searching earth and sea and air, refuge nowhere can I find. Save him only if my mind will cast off before it die the burden of this vanity. He identifies Zeus with the personified nature of things, the law or reason of the world, the law that is fate, and the father and all 
comprehending are here met together as one. Perhaps these concluding lines of his masterpiece, or his last words as a poet, two years after the Arastaya, we find him again in Sikla. Some believe that the audience, being more radical than the judges, did not like the trilogy, but this hardly accords with the fact that the Athenians, a few years later, and directly contrary to custom, decreed that his plays might be repeated in the theater of Dionysus, and that a chorus should be granted to anyone who offered to produce them. Many did, and Ascalus continued to win prizes after his death. Meanwhile, in Sikla, says an old story, an eagle had killed him by dropping a tortoise upon his bald head, mistaking it for a stone. Well, why? Oh, to break the turtle open, maybe? Um, but don't do that with a real turtle. Um, there, he was buried over his own epitaph, so strangely silent about his plays, so humanly proud of his scars. Beneath this stone lies Ascalus of his noble prowess. The growth of Marathon can speak, or the long-haired Persian who knows it well. <laughs>